If the resurrection never actually happened, then Jesus may be safely dismissed as just another interesting but tragic historical figure. That is true. Sounds like investigation is in order. Dr. William Lane Craig is well known among modern Christian apologist circles and has debated many high-profile skeptics like Lawrence Krauss, Sam Harris, Sean Carroll, Richard Dawkins, and the late Christopher Hitchens. With such credentials, when his Reasonable Faith Ministry posted a video series called Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? My hopes were high for some quality scholarship and arguments. Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? As we explore this question, we need to address two further questions. What are the facts that require explanation? And which explanation best accounts for these facts? That's one way to look at it. There are three main facts that need to be explained. Fact number one. The discovery that Jesus' tomb was empty is reported in no less than six independent sources. Let's take a look at the first one Craig put on screen. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5. It says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Forgive me, but where do these verses attest to an empty tomb? The word tomb doesn't appear at all. It says Jesus was buried. But that phrasing can apply equally to burial in a marked grave, an unmarked grave, or even a mass grave, the kind that nearly all Roman crucifixion victims are thrown into, as it can any kind of tomb. The passage is entirely silent on the kind of burial. This passage attests to a resurrection, but it absolutely does not attest to a tomb of any kind, full or empty. So we're down to five alleged independent sources. Now let's look at the Acts passage. Well, at least this one has the word tomb in it, but it speaks only of David's tomb. That's from a thousand or so years before Jesus. It says Jesus didn't decay, and again affirms a resurrection. But, again, literally nothing at all about a tomb for Jesus, full or empty. And even if it had mentioned an empty tomb, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are supposed to have been written by the same author, one the sequel of the other as a match set. They certainly wouldn't be considered independent sources. Speaking of independent sources... It is near universally acknowledged that Mark was a source for Matthew and Luke. Over 90% of Mark appears in these other books, very often word-for-word copying if you examine the original Greek. They are so similar that they are collectively called the Synoptic Gospels. These can no more be considered independent sources than a Harry Potter book, Harry Potter movie, and Harry Potter video game could be considered independent sources for the existence of Hogwarts School of Magic. The movie and the video game are obviously adaptations of the original book so are useless to corroborate it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke aren't independent sources by any reasonable definition, which leaves the gospel attributed to John. While some scholars make a compelling case that the author of John utilized the copy of Mark as a guide, for the sake of moving on, let's grant this one under protest and call Craig's six sources actually two sources. Two theological sources that obviously derive from familiar oral tradition. What we have here is the first of many details to be accepted entirely on the basis of For the Bible Tells Me So. And some of these are among the earliest materials to be found in the New Testament. If the earliest is most reliable, let's review the chart. This first one doesn't mention a tomb. The second one doesn't mention a tomb. The third one has a tomb, but doesn't have Jesus appear to anyone. These ones copied from Mark, but then added in some supposed appearances. By the time we get to this last one, it has all kinds of appearances and miracles and divine attributes, what scholars call a high Christology. This isn't early sources telling us about a resurrection. This is a pattern of legend that is growing over time. This is important because when an event is recorded by two or more unconnected sources, historians' confidence that the event actually happened increases. But since the alleged sources for the empty tomb aren't sources at all, and are most certainly not unconnected, Shouldn't that arrow point downward as we lower our confidence? Moreover, the Gospels indicate that it was women who first discovered that Jesus' body was missing. The Gospels indicate, or, or the Bible tells me so. This is likely historical because in that culture, a woman's testimony was considered next to worthless. Well, in a court of law situation, women could not provide testimony. That doesn't mean that women were of no influence when it came to communal matters. We have no records to speak to this either way. But if we believe the early church history presented in the Bible, women were of great influence in the Christian community. A later legend or fabrication would have had men make this discovery. The gospel stories weren't crafted to convince a court of law. They were attempting to present a believable narrative that would be spread among common people. In the gospel stories, the women were the first to discover the tomb for the same narrative reason crime dramas have early morning joggers discover bodies in the park, or maid service discovering problems in hotel rooms. That's who we would expect to be first on scene. 
It was the responsibility of women, not men, to tend to the bodies, and according to the narrative, the disciples had fled. So for what reasonable purpose would random, upstanding, court-worthy men have been the first to go visit a sealed and guarded tomb? That would have made no sense. An immediate flag that the story was false. To have had men making the discovery would have made the story sound fabricated. Our confidence in the empty tomb is further increased by the response of the Jewish authorities. When they heard the report that the tomb was found empty, they said that Jesus' followers had stolen his body. Not only is this alleged response by Jewish authorities completely and entirely, for the Bible tells me so, it's not even one of the details attested in multiple Gospels, like the kind Craig thinks we should have confidence in. This plan to blame the disciples for stealing the body is mentioned only in Matthew 28. In the chapter before, Matthew 27, we get the one and only report about Jerusalem zombies. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Perhaps one can make excuses why Jesus' resurrection isn't covered by any historians at the time. But does it make any sense at all that many people came out of their tombs, started wandering around a major city, and appeared in public to many people, and the historical documents of the day say nothing about such an event? Does William Lane Craig think that this event took place? This would be part of the typical sort of apocalyptic symbolism to show the earth-shattering nature of the resurrection and the need to be taken historically, literally. He does not. And yet we're supposed to take the conspiracy story with the guards at face value in the very next chapter? And how is the gospel writer supposed to have even been on hand to hear these exact quotations from those perpetrating the cover-up? This isn't a fact to be explained, it's a, or the Bible tells me so, story element. Most scholars, by far, hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. That certainly sounds compelling, but I have this habit of wanting to check the context of a quote before I make an assumption about what it means. But I had a bit of trouble finding this one, because the video inexplicably decided to change it. It was in William Lane Craig's own book, Reasonable Faith, Christian Truth and Apologetics, that I found Kremer's comment. By far, most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Why did the video deliberately change exegete to scholar? What is an exegete? It's someone whose job it is to interpret scripture. Would it come as any surprise that a scripture interpreter affirms the statement in scripture? These are people who start off accepting the text as divine, and from there are trying to discover theological nuance within it. Shouldn't we be asking what historians think about this alleged historical fact? Like many, Craig's book defers to the expertise of Gary Habermas, possibly the world's most prolific author and researcher of all things resurrection and champion of the minimal facts argument for the resurrection. But in a 2012 paper for the Southeastern Theological Review, Habermas insists that he does not consider the empty tomb to be an established historical fact. I have never counted the empty tomb as a minimal fact. It is very obvious that it does not enjoy the near unanimity of scholarship. From the very beginning of my research, I have been very clear about this. I just quoted someone, so you should please, please investigate for yourself to see if I used it in context. So why does William Lane Craig, a philosopher, go against the leading scholarships who are on his side? The empty tomb is not a fact. It's in the category of, the Bible tells me so. Fact number two the appearances of Jesus alive after his death. In one of the earliest letters in the New Testament, Paul provides a list of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances. Craig is referring to 1 Corinthians 15 here. It's worth noting that Paul prefaces this list by saying, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. A phrase that has virtual unanimity, that Paul is merely repeating a creed, a memorized saying that Paul heard. Paul cannot possibly corroborate this list, He's merely passing along what others have told him. He appeared to Peter, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Finally, he appeared also to me. According to Paul's own words in Galatians 1 and 2 Corinthians 12, when Jesus appeared to him, it was in a revelation, a vision that he explicitly would not affirm was in the body. It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. I'm excited that a Gerd Ludemann quotation is used here, because Ludemann is not a Christian and does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, so his words can add some credibility here. However, we should note that in this quotation, Ludemann does not affirm that Jesus actually appeared. Ludemann merely says that the disciples had experiences. 
for Ludeman affirms the view that all post-resurrection appearances were hallucinations in one form or another. Ludeman doesn't affirm what Craig posits. This is a quote mine, and quote mines are dishonest and should be beneath any truth-seeking Christian. More honest men, like Habermas and Lycona, agree that it is the disciples' belief in appearances that is the fact. Actual appearances cannot be considered a fact. It's, or the Bible tells me so. Fact number three, the disciples' belief in the resurrection. That's just what I said. This is what you should have called fact number two. So, these are the same thing. After Jesus' crucifixion, his followers were devastated, demoralized, and hiding in fear for their lives. There is no corroboration for this outside the New Testament. What happened to the disciples is purely, for the Bible tells me so. As Jews, they had no concept of a Messiah who would be executed by his enemies, much less come back to life. The only resurrection Jews believed in was a universal event on Judgment Day after the end of the world not an individual event within history. If we take the Gospels at face value, Jesus and the disciples were already diverging wildly from traditional Jewish beliefs like what can be done on the Sabbath. Their leader was constantly at odds with Jewish religious leaders. Why would they suddenly revert back to being beholden to Jewish tradition? Peter and the others were heavily invested in Jesus. Since we're speculating, maybe they didn't want to go back to fishing and came up with a way to keep their new occupation going. Equally plausible. Moreover, in Jewish law, Jesus' crucifixion as a criminal meant that he was literally under God's curse. Yet somehow, despite all of this, the disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. This is a commonly held myth, but we actually have no record from any of the twelve that they came to believe this. Other than Peter, who probably met Paul at some point, the twelve disappear entirely from history when Jesus dies. The idea that they were convinced, had their lives changed, or even participated in evangelism of any kind is entirely for the Bible tells me so. They were so completely convinced that, when threatened with death, not one of them recanted. As I said, we don't have records of them recanting because we don't have records about what happened to the Twelve at all. Well, there are two conflicting reports about Judas' death in the Bible, and Acts says that James was killed by King Herod without any further detail. But for the remaining ten, there are no reliable sources that tell us how any of them died or that any of them were threatened, let alone that even a single one of them was given a chance to recant or how they might have responded. This persecution idea is a centuries later tradition that isn't even in the Bible. But it's thrown out by apologists so often that people assume it's true. This one isn't even for the Bible tells me so, because it's not even biblical. I beg you to look this up for yourself. We don't know what happened to the disciples. These three firmly established facts. The Bible, the Bible, and not even the Bible. Though people like Craig try to get away with this one by including early converts as disciples, because it's a vague word with lots of uses. But these early converts were not the Twelve, and were not personal eyewitnesses to anything. This is just an acknowledgement that believers believed. Cry out for an adequate explanation. How do you make sense of them? Down through history, various naturalistic explanations have been offered to explain away these facts. The conspiracy hypothesis, the apparent death hypothesis, the hallucination hypothesis, and so on. Okay, there are five potential explanations on the board. For some reason he didn't read legend hypothesis, and lumped it in with and so on. But I'm looking forward to seeing how Craig deals with it. Let's examine the four most popular ones. Wait, the four most popular? Why aren't you addressing legend? I guess you've done some kind of research on popularity. First, the conspiracy theory. According to this view, the disciples faked the resurrection. They stole Jesus' body from the tomb and then lied about seeing Jesus alive, thereby perpetrating the greatest hoax of all time. However, Jews had no concept of a Messiah who would be defeated and executed by Israel's enemies, much less rise from the dead. We talked about this. We know that early Christian adherents differed from traditional Jewish thinking on all kinds of things. Differing is how denominations and religions split. Happens all the time. The conspiracy theory also fails to address the disciples' obvious sincerity. People don't willingly die for something they know is not true. We don't know of anyone who could have known personally if Christianity was true and could have saved their lives by recanting. None. For these and other reasons, no scholar defends the conspiracy theory today. If no scholar defends this theory, how is it in the four most popular? Why did we spend time on this? A second attempt to explain the facts is the apparent death theory. Jesus didn't really die. He revived in the tomb, somehow escaped, and managed to convince his disciples he was risen from the dead. This is sometimes called the swoon theory. 
I can't even find the last time this was used by a skeptic. It's been hundreds of years since this was seriously put forth. As a result, no New Testament historians defend this theory today. And yet this was among the top four most popular that needed addressing? A third explanation is the displaced body theory. Perhaps Joseph of Arimathea placed Jesus' body in his tomb temporarily because it was convenient. But later, he moved the corpse to a criminal's common graveyard. I've never even heard this one before. Who's proposing this? Once again, this theory cannot make sense of the facts. Jewish laws prohibited moving a corpse after it was interred, except to the family tomb. It can't have happened because it was against the law? Is that how you would do police work, William? You can't have been robbed, Mrs. Jones, because stealing is against the law. You must have broken your own windows and just misplaced all your jewelry. Keep looking. What's more, the criminal's graveyard was located close to the place of execution. I'm very excited that Craig acknowledges that the place most crucifixion victims were buried was a mass grave. That is absolutely what happened most of the time. And for an exception to be made for Jesus would have been an exceptional circumstance. Now, Josephus the historian indicated that such mass graves were typically out of town, not close by, but I'm not going to get picky on this point. Craig is right. There were criminals' graveyards, and that is where we would expect Jesus' body to be. So that burial there would not have been a problem. Also, once the disciples began to proclaim Jesus' resurrection, Joseph would have corrected their mistake. Well, that Joseph of Arimathea was a real person who existed in history is attested to only in the Bible. The entire tomb story is entirely for the Bible tells me so. So, once again, no current scholars endorse this theory. But scholars do endorse a much simpler version of this, that Jesus was immediately put into a mass grave, just like the vast majority of crucifixion victims. We know that it is precisely the most common case. Instead of debunking yet another theory, Craig admits that no one holds. Why is he afraid of scenarios that skeptics do actually hold? Finally, the hallucination theory. The disciples didn't really see Jesus, but just imagined that he appeared before them. They were all hallucinating. It's important to clarify the proponents of some form of hallucination theory vary on how many people would actually have had to hallucinate. When Craig says they were all hallucinating, it could really be as few as one or two people. This theory also faces considerable problems. First, Jesus appeared not just one time, but many times. This is a claim of the Bible, not an established historical fact. Not just in one place, but in different places. Not just to one person, but to different persons. Not just to individuals, but to groups of people. And not just to believers, but to unbelievers as well. There is nothing in the psychological casebooks on hallucinations comparable to these resurrection appearances. Well, that's simply not true at all. Post-bereavement hallucinatory events where people with no history of mental illness or psychological problems report interacting with the recently deceased, are common, widely documented, and well-studied in papers like these. Mass hysteria, not mass hallucinations, but mass hysteria, where reports of the fantastical spread in such a way that groups of people will internalize and genuinely believe they were witnesses to something, even though it can be confirmed that they were not, or that the event didn't happen at all. See papers like these. There's an entire line of study of post-traumatic stress hallucination papers like these. There's a line of study around the role of guilt in hallucination, of the kind that the Apostle Paul may have felt after being a persecutor of Christians. Again, see papers like these. The research here is extensive, Craig. For you to wave your hands and say there's nothing in psychological casebooks is not only demonstrably wrong and transparently disingenuous, it's frankly irresponsible. Finally, this theory doesn't even attempt to explain the empty tomb. Well, no. Because even the world's leading resurrection researchers, like Kona and Habermas, will admit that the empty tomb can't be labeled a historical fact. Thus, the four most popular naturalistic theories fail to explain the historical facts. Again, historians do not consider these first two to be facts. They're details in a story. No different than attempting to use a zigzag scar and an invisible cloak as evidence that the events of Harry Potter are historical. And this third fact is entirely just people who believe that Jesus rose from the dead believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That's just a statement with no explanatory power. No different than saying people who think they were abducted by aliens think they were abducted by aliens. With Craig's line of argumentations, we're left entirely with the question, do you believe that the Bible is a reliable source? If you do, then this entire video was hand-waving that doesn't matter. The Bible says Jesus arose, so there's no need to separately affirm a tomb, appearances, transformed lives, earthquakes, curtains, or any of that. If you believe the Bible, you believe the Bible. End of story.
If you don't think the Bible is a reliable source, well, there's nothing in this video for you. You too are left exactly where you began. Either way, this video and line of argumentation will change the mind of exactly no one. Where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with you completely ignoring the explanation on the board that is actually held by skeptics. That the resurrection is a legend. That the details you're attempting to explain are merely part of a tall tale that grew. Why did you spend time on theories that no one holds? And ignore this obvious answer that is widely held. If Christianity is true, why misrepresent the position and fail to address the main objections? By using altered quotations, conflating definitions, presenting misleading statements, and avoiding the primary objections, you have made your position look all the weaker. It's almost as if this video is only for current believers who haven't given their position any serious thought. So how do you explain the resurrection? It's funny you should ask. I recently posted a video called How Christianity Probably Began Without a Resurrection. It's shorter than William Lane Craig's, so I hope you'll take a few minutes to see how all the pieces can fit together without any distortion of facts or history. See you there.